I'm here tonight to share about the original social distancers of the world's fire lookouts. Let's take it away. I was very fortunate to live and work in Glacier National Park for five years out of college. My favorite thing to do on my days off was to run up into the high country of the park, visiting fire lookouts and the alpine chalets, like Granite Park Chalet, where you can run there, eat a piece of peach pie, crush a bag of Doritos, chug a Coke, and run back down to the valley floor. It is incredible. I fell in love with the fire lookouts of the park, like Huckleberry Lookout. It has a nice runnable grade built for horse travel up to the lookout, bushes loaded with the lookout's namesake on the way up, and of course, stunning views at the top. I applied for a job as fire lookout and was dismissed due to excessive snooziness, unfortunately. But it was there that I met John, or as I call him, the Huckleberry Heckler. On my first all-out running push up to Huckleberry during a short window of time off, I arrived to Huckleberry Lookout, hands on knees, gasping for breath. I look out and I see John there standing on the catwalk looking down at me, and he says, so how long did it take you? I'm like, 72 minutes, not bad, right? He's like, I saw a lady do it in 68 last week. <laughs> John was a tough guy, but over time, he warmed up to me that summer. He eventually invited me into his lookout, where I got to see the tools of the trade and learn more about this unique existence of social isolation that he had up in the hills. First, I thought all fire lookouts were people that were just recluses that wanted to spend time by themselves up in the mountains. But over time, I found that they're part of a network of incredibly sophisticated and well-developed communicators that play a critical role in fire management. I wanted to learn more about them and their history, which really goes back to 1910. This is the year of the big burn. Many of you know this is the year that burned three million acres of forest across Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. 78 forest firefighters died that year. And the 10 a.m. rule was established, in which the Forest Service wanted all fires put out 10 a.m. the day after they were uh, spotted. But people like Frank Liebig had to manage 600,000 acres on their own. You see, Frank managed from West Glacier to Canada, west of the Continental Divide. So he's managing for bootleggers, illegal homesteaders, and putting out all the fires by himself. So if you're having difficulty with your quarter acre lawn, think about Frank, come on. So, okay, Forest Service HR is like, all right, we got a problem, we need to staff up. So they made the big and bold decision to double their staff. Now they got two guys managing 600,000 acres. One of them stands there with his binoculars observing the fires, and he's like, hey, there's a fire. The other one grabs his shovel and his canvas water pail and sprints to put it out by himself. Eventually, some technology emerged, like the heliograph, which could use sun flares to transmit the location via Morse code of fires from the high ridges down to the valley floors. Uh, rangers experimented with everything from homing pigeons to dynamite. But unfortunately, over time, dynamite used to transmit an auditory signal from the mountains to the peaks would start more forest fires than it would put out. So a network of phones was established throughout the forest. 64,000 miles of number nine wire, phone wire, were established throughout the national forests. And you can still see them strewn about national forests and public lands today. But the lookouts themselves were extremely rudimentary and simple things. You got your pile of rocks to stand on, look for the fire, and you got your map stand to locate, pinpoint the location of the fire. So we actually had two of these lookouts very similar to this close to home on Mount Blackmore and Mount Ellis. So the Forest Service is patting themselves on the back. They're like, well, that pile of rocks idea was pretty good, you know? Gets you way up there, you can look down at the fire. But a young upstart and visionary says, what is taller than a pile of rocks? A tree! And the lookout tree is established. This is actually on Horse Butte Point, one of the early lookout trees located above Hebgen Reservoir. Over time, a man has creature comforts. He wants to kick back, fill his Yeti cooler with Coors lights, and watch the fires roll in in peace. So over time, some of these structures were developed mid-tree where they could watch with a bit more comfort. But it wasn't until 1915 that the fire lookout as we know it today was established. This is up on Mount Hood, and the guy in the foreground is Liege Coleman. I call him Liege the Locomotive because Liege transported 685 loads of material to build this lookout to the top of Mount Hood by himself. After Liege's lookout was established in 1915, the lookout system exploded across the American West. By 1940, we had 5,000 lookouts across the West, 
600 in Montana, Northwest Montana, which we're looking at here. But today we only have 100 of those lookouts still standing in Montana. Why is that? As you can imagine, I love this casual dude eating a bagel watching his lookout burn. Lookouts are in the harshest environments in our state. High alpine, icy, frigid, cold, wind, rain. By 1960, so many of these lookouts had fallen into disrepair that the Forest Service ironically decided to destroy them with fire. This is at the same time that new technologies are emerging, like satellite imagery, aerial monitoring, and even drones to monitor fires. We've all been privy to the conversations going on these days about automation and artificial intelligence replacing jobs. How does that factor into fire lookouts today? People like Inez, who's a lookout in Northwest Montana, will quickly tell you that automation and artificial intelligence will never replace the lookout. Inez can spot smoke from a fire before satellite imagery can. If it's rainy, snowy, lightning, planes can't fly, but Inez can still be there watching, monitoring the fires, and transmitting back to base. Most importantly, these lookouts have an incredible and intimate connection, a poetic one with the landscape. This is Porcupine Lookout in North Central Glacier Park, one of the most remote points in the lower 48. I think we can all agree this is a room with a view. Maybe somewhere you'd like to spend some time, but you're not ready to be a lookout yourself. Well, thankfully, there's a way you can try it out. Just down the road from us, Garnet Lookout, between here and Big Sky, is a lookout that you can rent for just $65 a night. You gotta work to get there, hike up to Garnet, but you can picture yourself here for one night uh, with a friend or two playing lookout. Hopefully you don't have to observe any fires that night, but you can, as John Muir said, climb the mountains and earn their good tidings. Thank you.